I'm going to talk uh, about big data, which is, of course, very fashionable, very prevalent, um, almost everywhere in the world. Uh, but I'm really going to be talking about it from the viewpoint of someone who lives in the UK, specifically England, um, because I was from some other part of the UK, like Scotland. Um, I would want to talk about that, because in many ways, what happens in the devolved parts of the UK, that is Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, is actually quite different from England. Um, so I think what I have to say will, in terms of the UK, largely apply to England, but I assume and hope that many of the issues I'm going to talk about uh, are relevant to you, and I hope to learn something uh, from you in the discussion at the end um, about how relevant some of my concerns are uh, to your own concerns. Okay, so enough of that. Uh, those of you familiar with Bristol will know that's Bristol Suspension Bridge, uh, built by Brunel in the 19th century. Uh, it's one of the great sites of Bristol, uh, apart from the university, that is. So, um, I'm going to talk about big data, and I want to concentrate on <coughs> certain aspects of, of big data. I want to talk about data quality, uh, I want to talk about subroot analysis. I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about data linkage, uh, because data linkage is one of the things that kind of uh, is a key element of the way big data will be handled. It's the linking together of different sets of data. Um, that's one of the big promises, but it's not as straightforward as might seem, or as many people uh, might think. I want to talk a little bit about uh, communicating the outcomes of the handling of big data. Um, and I'm going to finish up <coughs> a little more detailed kind of case history uh, about what I call measurement error. And I'll explain about that uh, when I come to it. And it's something that um, Michelle and I uh, happen to be, and Joy Cumming happen to be, working on at the moment um, in ACU. So, um, what's the promise of big data? Well, uh, first of all, um, big data comes in different forms. Um, sometimes it's data just collected because it's there. So data from social media, from Twitter, Facebook, and so on, um, or data that people like Google harvest um, from all their activities. That's not planned data. It's data that's there, but it's easy to pick up. Okay, you control the internet. There's enormous amounts uh, of, of data, pent petabytes of data, um, which people are beginning to come to terms with, but present some real Challenges. And I'm not really going to talk about that. It's all really quite interesting, um, but I'm not going to say very much uh, about that. It's a very big topic. Um, and, and of course, data from consumers, commercial data that's clear is very important, but it tends to be inaccessible to people other than the people who collect it. So it's not public data in any real sense, and I'm not going to be talking about that, although it's quite an interesting topic. Um, so data are used for many purposes, commercial purposes, uh, if it's collected uh, from consumers, for example. It's used to, for research into behaviour, social research more generally. Um, and one of the nice things about the potential of big data is it's so big you can look at very special subgroups in the data, which you normally can't do, <coughs> either because in some way they're remote, difficult data to collect, uh, and if you're going to collect data in a general way, uh, unless you have absolutely enormous amounts of data, there aren't many individuals uh, in a particular subgroup for you to look at. But if you've got data on whole populations over time, uh, then you can often um, do some very nice things looking at subgroups. So I'm really concerned much more with what you might call data collected by mandate, <coughs> as in by legislation, 
Um, so this includes government data, largely, and um, there's lots of people from government here. Um, and it's essentially that's public data. Um, it's held by governments, but it's held by governments for public purposes, and most governments uh, will recognise that, and many governments are trying to promote the active use and analysis of such data. Of course, it's not collected, uh, for example, for research purposes, it's collected for administrative purposes. Nevertheless, uh, in there, there is some very interesting, useful information, health, education, revenue, uh, and so on. So in the UK, for example, we have had a recent piece of legislation um, that actually allows and encourages all government departments, with a few sensitive exceptions, uh, to deposit data with their National Statistics Office so that they can then do things like linking data and making data available for further use. Rather bizarrely, uh, health is not included, so that everything except health uh, I can get linked. Don't ask me why, uh, but it wasn't included. Um, OK, let me press on. So there's lots of potential out there, uh, much of which is obvious, uh, but there are some issues, there's some problems. Um, there's one of the biggest problems that's beginning to arise is the so-called confidential privacy issue. Um, OK, let me leave the private sector alone for, for a minute, but with public data, once uh, public data, previously public data had resided within specialist agencies that collected for their own purpose, if now those data are going to be released for research, either public research or private research, uh, for example, uh, for commercial purposes, um, so data might be released to insurance companies and so on, um, then a whole lot of ethical issues arise. And the issue that many people are particularly concerned about is the issue of threats to privacy, so that data on individuals can get released. So the data can be attacked by malicious people who have some information on individuals they know are somewhere in a data set. Uh, they might have some access to the data set. They might be able to identify the individuals from the data they have and hence possibly um, get into the data file and extract other information which may be very sensitive. So that's not a, a new concern. Um, and lots of people are concerned about protecting data, anonymizing data, making it resistant to track for a long time. But now with the continual linking of different data sets, uh, these possibilities increase. And with the dissemination to more and more people. And we had uh, in the UK some two years ago with health data, uh, we had a, a release um, of um, of, well, it wasn't actually a release of data, it was a set of proposals to merge individual data on primary health care uh, with hospital data for analysis purposes, um, but also for release to commercial sector, like uh, drug companies and so on, uh, for their purposes. And it was done in such a, a way, uh, without informing people properly, uh, that there was such an outcry that the whole thing had to be dropped. And that gave a big impetus to what I would call the privacy lobby, who had become very vociferous and very uh, powerful um, in, in some cases quite rightly, trying to understand where there might be leakages of information or abuse of information. Uh, but beyond that, uh, very concerned about the dissemination, dissemination of information more generally. So in the last few months, uh, for example, our Department for Education in England has stopped access to a massive research database consisting of longitudinal data on every child in the school maintained system in England. Um, that had been available several years for, to researchers 
to analyze, uh, suddenly that stopped being available, um, partly as results concerned about privacy leakage. Although there were no, as far as I know, known leakages of the data, um, the, one of the natural instincts of many government departments uh, if, uh, is, to, uh, is to draw back and stop releasing the data. Um, they've actually had a few second thoughts, so some release the data will become available, but certainly not in the same easy to use format as, as formerly. So it is a, a real issue with the exploitation of big data, and which of course is my concern as, as a researcher um, is, and, and indeed the ostensible government concern is if you're going to have all these data and release it, then someone should be doing something with it, analysing it hopefully, in a sensible way. Um, the other issue that I want to highlight is a concern with data quality. Just because data are there, it uh, doesn't mean to say uh, they can just be used, as it were, off the shelf. If you're carrying out a bespoke survey, uh, anyone that's done that will know that you have to spend months, if not years, cleaning the data, ironing out the problems in the data, even though you've tried to collect it according to strict protocols, uh, it never comes in that way. It always has problems. Uh, that's the sort of thing that, for example, large administrative data sets don't have, at least not in the same way. There is checking that goes on, of course, um, but it isn't usually to the same standard of data quality um, that might be required for research purposes. Um, and a lot of data, of course, um, is acquired in a commercial or semi-commercial setting um, and the organisations acquiring it are not as experienced or as thorough uh, as um, research uh, organisations um, such as uh, market research uh, outfits and so on. So there is a big issue about data quality and it's very difficult to know quite how one deals with this because ideally data quality should be addressed at source, should be addressed at the point at which data come in rather than down the line when it becomes more difficult to assess. Um, so there is a big issue which I think hasn't really been thought about very carefully about how you not just ensure data quality but you actually tell people who are going to use the data what the quality of the data are like. And that, that's an important issue. So <coughs> just uh, as a way of illustration, I'm going to talk about Google flu. I don't know whether people here are familiar with the Google flu episode. Well, it's, it's, it's an instructive one. <coughs> um, this is the, the reference, if anybody wants to look it up. But in 2009, uh, Google started to release predictions of flu epidemics. And they did this because in previous years, uh, they collected information um, from people that were using uh, their various services. Uh, they, they scraped the information um, and then correlated it with the onset of uh, flu epidemics. Um, and what they found was there was a very high correlation between words that were relevant to having flu, like a high temperature, not feeling well, and so on, and subsequent flu epidemics. And in fact, this was over two or three years, seemed to be a consistent uh, correlation. So they started um, in 2009 predicting the next flu epidemics. And actually, they appear to be doing better um, <coughs> as a center for diseases uh, in the United States. And this uh, was one of the things that was touted as an enormous advantage of big data. Look, here we can do this. Unfortunately for Google, <coughs> after about three years, the whole thing crashed and they got it completely wrong. Um, uh, it's not clear why they got it wrong. There are various kind of versions. But basically, uh, what was happening was that they did find uh, these strong correlations, but they never really understood why 
these correlations exist. In other words, there was no causal explanation. They hadn't uncovered a causal mechanism. They were just playing around with the numbers. Um, and, and then the numbers changed. Something changed um, that destroyed uh, that link. So the causal mechanism was not understood. It changed its pathways, just like the flu virus changes and mutates. Um, and, and they had egg on their face. Um, and uh, so they withdrew it. Um, they went away, and no doubt, over the years, they will come back with some better prediction at, at some stage when they perhaps better understand the true causal mechanisms. But it is something that is very tempting to do with big data. So people do it. The data are there, looks wonderful. It's so easy. Just relate one thing to another thing over time. You've got the data uh, and then go public with it. But beware. It's not a new problem. It's a problem that statisticians have been aware of uh, for decades. It's in all the textbooks. Don't assume that correlation implies causation. Um, so uh, Google got it wrong, um, and other people can get it wrong as well. It's very easy to do, but it's always a question uh, that one needs to ask. OK, um, so. They, this is an example of linking data, link data across several uh, contexts. Um, I've already talked about uh, the consent that people give, the issues of privacy. But when you start linking data, so if you're linking data on education and health, people may have consented to their data going into a data repository in a health department to be used by researchers. Um, either within that department or in academia uh, for, for research of different kinds. And people typically, are very, certainly with health data, are very willing to allow their data to be used <coughs> for the public benefit in that way, indeed with education data as well. But once they become linked, there is an issue about that, whether that consent carries over. So if someone's given permission for their health data to be used and they're given permission for education data abuse, have they given permission for the linking, the linked files to be used? Not necessarily. So there is uh, an ethical issue around that, which is rather important and has to be addressed at the time in which data are collected. So people have to be given some kind of procedure for consenting um, and one of the issues that is now looming large in the UK, again, it may not have come up here yet, <coughs> is there two ways of giving consent. You can either opt out or you can opt in. So if someone wants to collect my health data, my primary health care records, I can be given the option of saying, I'm opting out of these being linked to anything else or being sent to anybody for research. Um, that's fine, and a certain percentage, maybe 10, 15 percent, might opt out. Um, on the other hand, uh, my general practitioner, when they approach me, she might say to me, um, actually, uh, you have to opt in to your health records being used for linkage research purposes. If you do that, you'll find about 10 or 15 percent people only opt-in. In other words, you can't do research on it. Um, we found this in a, in a project where we wanted to um, make use of birth records uh, held by a of national statistics to link to some survey data uh, and they first of all agreed they would send out to a list of names we gave them. Um, we wouldn't do this, they would do that, asking people were okay uh, with their birth, inf birth record information being given to us. And initially that was to be an opt-out. Uh, just before it went out, it was changed to an opt-in, um, but we got 12% response. So the whole thing had to be dropped. Um, so there's a real, really big issue, and, and I think one of the reasons they changed was that government, as a government department, they'd suddenly become overcautious um, about 
the whole kind of privacy consent issues. So in terms of utilising big data, this is going to, it's not going to go away. This is an issue that has to be faced and, and tackled. Um, it becomes much worse, of course, if any of the organisations involved um, are commercial organisations, basically for profit commercial organisations. Um, and one of the, <coughs> some people are suggesting that one of the reasons the education data was cut off was because the uh, l some of the linking that had to be done to provide the education data was actually being done by a commercial organisation. It was a so-called not-for-profit organisation, but that's, by the way, it was being done by a commercial organisation and a lot of the privacy people were complaining uh, about that, as indeed were some parents, apparently. Um, and so <coughs> everybody suffered. Um, and, and that's actually been an increasing issue, uh, certainly in England, um, that government departments, as many of you will know, uh, under previous series of previous governments, have tried to outsource as much as they can. And the outsourcing, of course, has been largely to commercial organisations who essentially have profited from this. And this has created a lot of concern um, about the data and who's using it, as it were, who's making a profit out of it. So there's all those kind of background things. But I think I said earlier, data linkage is one of the key concepts, one of the key drives. You can't link data. The, the potential of big data is, becomes rather limited. Um, so, um, we have some jurisdictions, particularly famously in the Scandinavian countries, where <coughs> everybody has an ID, an identity, and everything gets linked to everything else uh, through that identity. It does not appear to be a problem. Um, and if you talk to people in the Nordic countries, uh, they will say that they have very good data, and I believe them. Um, and it's increasingly being used uh, for very innovative research. Um, and ultimately, uh, in those countries, we're going to see the results of this ability to have data on whole populations um, of high quality, largely. Um, nevertheless, it's, the quality isn't perfect. Um, and one of the things I think is still lacking in some of these places is a full disclosure, a full understanding of the data quality. Because again, this is data collected not for research purposes primarily, but for administrative purposes. And data collected for administrative purposes from people uh, is always subject uh, to the, as it were, people telling the truth. People may not always tell the truth about themselves, um, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons. Um, but if they don't tell the truth uh, about themselves, they underestimate something or overestimate it, uh, then that diminishes the quality of the data. So there's some understanding of that's important. It's not enough just to collect the data. Um, but certainly in the case where, for example, benefits may depend on how many children you have or the ages of your children or, or whatever, uh, there's often a strong incentive not to tell the exact truth, but to modify it in ways that uh, might benefit you. So simply because the data are high quality in the sense they've been carefully scrutinised <coughs> and fairly complete, it doesn't mean to say uh, that you can just use them without any attention to quality. Um, they've got this down to fairly fine art. In other countries, um, the linking um, of data collected over time uh, is a big issue. If there's no kind of central reference, like an individual identity to which everything is referred, um, and in many countries there isn't. And certainly in the UK, there's a strong opposition 
to this, and has been for a long time, uh, associated to some extent with a lack of trust in, in government agencies, um, it becomes extremely difficult uh, to do a proper linking across time. So if you've got individuals coming in and out of hospitals, um, uh, you can uh, try and link the different episodes they spend in hospitals, but since there isn't a single identity, even though we have something called a national health service number, it's not always that reliable um, and doesn't always get recorded properly. Uh, so you have to try and link on people's names, addresses and so on, all of which is quite unreliable. Um, it becomes a difficult process uh, and there's a lot of interest at the moment in the UK of setting up what are called population splines. I know there is here in Australia. Um, and it's happening within health and within the population uh, more generally. Uh, but this is very early days to uh, comment on that. Um, the problem is that if you don't do it properly, you're going to be making mistakes. You're going to be linking the wrong people over time. Or you're going to be linking uh, someone's health record with somebody else's education record when you think it's the same person. Um, moreover, this linkage error is not going to be random. We know from lots of research that it's uh, a highly non-random process. It's certain types of individuals don't get linked properly. And if uh, that carries through uh, and you start analysing data, you can make quite uh, false and biased inferences about relationships um, and so on. So. Uh, one of the issues that some of us are working on in London at University College now is the problem of how you capture in linked data the uncertainties of linkage and how you can feed those through to when the data get analysed. And that's not a trivial problem. So again, um, it is an issue one needs to be concerned about. People talk about linking data but it isn't a straightforward process. It, it needs careful attention. So, um, well, here's a little bit about linkage. How are we going? I won't spend too long on this, um, but this is a reference to some work uh, we published on uh, linkage um, and the need for linkage to be transparent. Um, so the way data are linked or the algorithm that is used to link data is available to the people that are going to make use of the linked data. And again, one of the issues here, yeah, this is, um, in, at least in, in England, is because a lot of the linkage is devolved to commercial companies, they will not tell you how they do the linkage. They will say, let me give you linked data. So it's a black box. And although many people suspect it's not done very well, um, and uh, it's very difficult to find out how it's done. So it, it is a big issue um, that is tied up with certain ideological considerations, so it, it's problematic. Um, so I've already talked about this. <coughs> um, the other thing is, of course, that you have to be aware that many data sets are incomplete in terms of population coverage. So. The National Pupil Dataset, which is the one I referred to, uh, uh, the education dataset in England, is fine, it's pretty good, but it only applies uh, to children in the state-maintained sector. It does not apply to privately educated children, who, of course, are very different in their characteristics. Um, so it doesn't have full coverage of the population, and that can be a problem when you start trying to link it. Um, and the other thing which, again, I'd like to talk more about but to have time, um, is that, of course, many data are used for what might call data management purposes. So educational data uh, in the UK, certainly in England, but not in Scotland, um, as I believe in Australia, 
are also used for management purposes. So your NAPLAN data uh, is used to provide rankings for schools. It's available on a website uh, for parents to make comparisons between schools. Um, but the data are the data that are generated uh, by the students in the system. They're things like test scores, uh, information about um, schooling, uh, you in NAPLAN also inf have information about students, some information about student background, as we do in the UK, in England, uh, in the National Pupil data set. Um, and as soon as data become uh, usable for management purposes, there are incentives um, for the data to have certain values. Um, and so we've had lots of instances uh, in England, it's now well documented of the way in which the data collection process becomes distorted by the school league tables that are published as rankings, comparing one school uh, with another. Schools will play the system, and so the data quality uh, then becomes degraded. Um, so that's the other feature of these large data sets. You have to actually bear that in mind. The data may be telling you as much about the way in which people within the system uh, manipulate the data or attempt to manipulate the data uh, as about what the data are meant to represent. And that's not just true in education, uh, that's true in, uh, or could, can become true in uh, many uh, other um, areas such as health, for example, the release of hospital statistics on mortality, um, where hospitals are encouraged to kind of compete in the league table system also has that. And again, there's documentation that shows that people will game the system, uh, which tends to destroy uh, the data. And that will almost always happen when data uh, are used in that way. And it's one of the features of big data uh, that is very difficult to deal with, at least in uh, the kind of situation mere that um, pertain in many uh, countries. So uh, I want to sort of go through quite quickly. Um, okay, uh, don't really want to talk very much about this, um, but <coughs> validity, I have said something about. <coughs> The encouragement of subgroup analysis is very important uh, for, for big data. But when you're doing this, <coughs> you have to be even more aware of data quality because now you're getting down, sometimes looking at special groups. These might be ethnic minorities, for example. Um, and there, uh, you may have particular difficulties with data quality, because very often those data, for all sorts of reasons, it's more difficult to collect and so on, um, may have uh, different degrees of quality from the data as a whole. So even though <coughs> one of the great things about big data sets is you can study these subgroups, you have to be extra careful about the quality of the data uh, when you get down to that level. Um, missing data, it's a little bit about that. Um, again, data are not missing at random. So if you're missing, so you're trying to link data and some people are missing information on the linkage identifiers. For example, you've got missing information on name or date of birth. Uh, those records will tend not to get linked, but they will be special kind of people. Um, so missing data is generally a kind of whole issue that affects all kinds of data. Um, but it's a particular issue with uh, data uh, linkage. And this is just a sort of plug for some work we've been doing on how you handle missing data. But that's more for the kind of data analysis stage. Um, but you do have to bear it in mind when the data sets are being constructed that missing data can be important. So I finally want to dwell on measurement error. <coughs> and there's going to be a little bit of notation here. 
um, a bit of algebra, but it's not going to be very technical. Um, now, the thing about measurement error, um, it's a bit true of missing data as well, is that it really doesn't matter how big your data set, you are going to be just as affected by measurement error as if your data set is very small. In other words, the size of the data does not change in any way at all, uh, really, um, the importance of understanding and dealing with errors of measurement, measurement error. And in education, uh, most people know, most people who have analysed education data will kind of be aware of the fact that measurement error exists. So if you're collecting, you're trying to ascertain someone's achievement in mathematics, um, then you know that what you actually measure is subject to some error. It's not the sort of true value you'd get by repeatedly kind of measuring somebody um, over a short period of time, for example, which you usually can't do. Um, but it has idiosyncrasies. You may have a rather short test instrument you're using um, or, or whatever. Um, but there is measurement error. And sometimes it can be very large. And we also know that it can totally screw up any analysis you do. So if you don't take account of it properly, you can be making big mistakes. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of how this uh, can happen. In other words, the, uh, the situation is really you're measuring something, x, OBS stands for observed, it's the thing you're measuring, it's your math test score. What you really want to measure uh, is the true, so if in some sense, underlying or latent uh, mathematics ability. Um, can't do that. <coughs> so you assume a simple model where the observed is some underlying true plus a measurement error, m. OK. And you don't know what m is. Um, now, and um, something called the reliability is simply the variation or the variance of the true values, uh, that's wrong. That should be the variance of x observed, not the variance of m. Um, uh, and so if this uh, is, uh, if this is uh, very high, it implies that uh, m is very small because the, uh, the between individual variance of the true scores is very similar to the observed scores. Uh, and if it's low, you're in trouble because there's a lot of measurement error. There's a lot of variability due to measurement error, and we need to do something about it. But that's easily said and not so easily done. Uh, very often, we don't know what this reliability is. We don't know how big these measurement errors are. Are they small or are they big? Um, sometimes uh, we have estimates that are available, but we're often not told where they come from. They may be brought in from another uh, group entirely to the one we're interested in. In about 30 years ago, a couple of us wrote a review of um, tests in that were used in education, um, mainly UK, but a lot from the US as well, I think one or two from down here. Um, and it was amazing how many of the published tests that were available did not supply any estimates of how reliable they were. So you didn't know whether uh, the reliability was 0.99 or 0.65. Didn't know. Um, software for handling measurement errors is uh, not readily available. And the awareness of doing it <coughs> if you read the educational literature, uh, it's not very widespread. Um, even though it's quite clear that often when people are analysing data, they probably should be uh, taking account of measurement error, but they're not. Here's an example. Um, so, big data, um, as I said, measurement error is always, always an issue particularly because the data are often collected with not under the same stringent conditions that research data would be collected. So if you're trying to 
collect information about mathematics achievement uh, in a survey, you might go to some pains. If you're just collecting it, <coughs> for example, from teachers or from some kind of casual instrument for some kind of administrative purpose, it goes into a database, um, it might have a lot of measurement error in it. So it might be an even more important issue with big data than with little data. Um, so don't can ignore all of this, it's a bit technical. Um, but one of the things that uh, Michelle and I are currently working on here, one of the reasons I'm here is to find out ways of actually estimating these liabilities. It's not easy, we're struggling with it, um, but we think it's something worth uh, pursuing. So data set size is irrelevant, maybe making things worse. So here's a cautionary tale, um, and this was um, <coughs> actually taken from a survey. Um, it was the 1970 UK birth cohort survey, some will have heard of that. So about 17,000 children who were all born in one week in 1970 and are still being followed up. Okay, And it's about their early years. And... Uh, these were basically the interest was in uh, high social class or high SES children and low SES children and their, the relative progress they made in very early years. This is between the ages of three and five years and just before they started school to the time they entered school. A period that many people feel is crucial um, and the idea was to see whether um, the uh, high and low SES children, where the gap which existed at three years was increasing between three and five years or getting smaller. And, and that potentially might have some <coughs> influence uh, or information for policy. So here's the graph. Let me take you through this um, so-called killer graph. Um, so here we have, um, okay, so the, the symbols here, first of all, this square represents high ability, high social class children, okay? Uh, this one here, this rhomboid here, okay, represents here high ability, low SES children. So at three, well age in months, sorry this is age, this is age two actually, why is this three? Okay, anyway, down here, um, the, that scale must be wrong, anyway down here we have two groups of children um, and at the 90th percentile of ability a sample was selected of high SES children and low SES children and look what happens. By the time they get down here, these tests are standardised, time they get down here, these have sort of fallen away a bit, but look what's happened to these. And then compare that with this group who started off as low ability but they were high social class children compared to this group that were low ability, low social class children. And this is the thing that the author drew attention to, this crossover. So you could be low ability, high SES at the start, and if you compare that with high ability, low SES, by the time you reach this age, you've overtaken them. Okay. Uh, this graph actually reached the Houses of Parliament. Um, it was put up as an example of how awful government education policies were um, at dealing with social disadvantage. Look what was happening. Uh, we need to pour massive amounts of money into that. Right, so, it's an example. It's, uh, 
big data, it's a big study. Um, where does measurement error come in? If this is true, this is, this is dramatic. This is quite dramatic. Uh, but is it true? And there are two issues here. Um, the first <coughs> issue, which is um, not particularly to do with measurement error, uh, but is actually a rather subtle one that almost all the critics of this failed to understand initially, is that if you take low SES children, okay, um, and high SES children, who are all above, in this case, the 90th percentile of achievement, actually, because on average, low SES children have lower achievement than high SES children, that is still going to be true in the top 10%. In the top 10%, the low ability children actually have a lower mean value than the high ability children because their whole distribution is shifted down. So you're not actually, whoops, yeah, there we are. Um, you're not actually comparing like with like. You're comparing in that group, so-called high ability, you're comparing uh, your high SES children who have a higher high ability than your low SES children who have a lower high ability. And that's the first one. It's quite a serious uh, problem. Um, it's associated with phenomenon known as regression to the mean. Um, but uh, that's one of the things that's overlooked. So in fact, uh, that's a criticism of the way the analysis is done. This is not an appropriate analysis. Um, it appears to be straightforward, but actually it's full of um, trips. Um, and if you're not careful, you're going to make some serious uh, mistakes uh, like this. So that's the first thing. Um, but the second thing is uh, true measurement error. So let me now. Um, OK, this is just, uh, uh, this caused a, uh, uh, quite a, a heated discussion. Um, it was extensively quoted in Parliament. And then these two people wrote a critique in 2012. <coughs> and, um, and we wrote another critique, which was also criticizing this, um, in 2015. Um, so it's, it's been through the ringer. Uh, it's had a lot of exposure. Um, so the point is uh, measurement error. So here's what I wrote down to, and this now is correct. Um, and it turns out um, that uh, if you know the reliability for this initial test, the early age and the later test, you can make a proper adjustments. If you don't, um, then any analysis you do is really going to be quite misleading. Um, so uh, that I've already mentioned. So I'm now going to, because of this, because that type of analysis is not appropriate, you can reformulate the analysis as follows. Sorry, this is now a little bit technical. So this, for those of you who know, is a regression analysis. And basically what it's doing is it's saying, uh, we have some outcome, which is our five-year test score. And we're going to relate it to um, our uh, test score at the age of three, <coughs> and also to some indicators of which socioeconomic group we're in. You don't need to kind of worry uh, too much about this, but this would be the standard way in which most statisticians would approach an understanding of change between those two occasions. You've got the same children. Um, so understanding the relationship between year five and year three, and whether that relationship changes or is different for the different social groups is the appropriate way uh, to understand whether more or less progress is being made. 
So if the change um, is different, if there's a social group effect, all right, we can conclude that differential progress is being made um, according to the social group you're in. Um, but to do this, you need to know uh, what the reliability, particularly this, uh, this one as well, but particularly this variable actually is. So this is the three year score. And it turns out that we don't know that. It's not available. It was not, it was one of those tests that somehow was used, uh, but nobody saw fit to actually try and estimate uh, the reliability or the measurement error at the time. Uh, so we don't know what this is. But judging by estimates we have from similar tests, we do know the agency, they're not very reliable. So we think the reliability of this is actually rather low. It's greater than 0.5, you can ascertain that, but it could be anywhere between that and 1. It's probably nearer 0.7, um, but we don't know. Um, and so what we did is we did an analysis um, don't worry about this. Um, and we first of all assumed a reliability 0.75, um, but we ran it also uh, for a reliability 0.65, which is pretty low. Um, and we looked at what difference it made uh, to the social class effect, the social group differences. Um, and here's just a summary um, of that, and I just want to focus on a couple of things. This, these two here, um, are comparisons. This one here, this is on, it's on a standardized scale. So it's on a s standard deviation scale. This is the difference between, as you were, this is a measure of progress, if you like, made um, by those in low SES group compared to the middle SES group, the, sorry, the middle SES group. And SES here is being defined by income. So what we've done is we've taken a low group, which is the lowest quartile, middle group, which is from the lowest quartile to the upper quartile, and then the upper quartile. So the lowest 25% uh, make less progress. This is a stand error in there. But it's quite odd. It's about 0.2 of a standard deviation, which is quite significant um, than those in the middle income range. And in the high SES group, uh, the opposite of that. They make more progress. So what you might expect and what the previous graph was showing, that if you're in low SES group, you're making less progress. You're falling behind. But this is assuming no measurement error. If we now move to a measurement error 0.25, which is consistent with reliability of 0.75, we now get some changes. This 0.2 goes down to minus 0.1. So it's still there, but it's not as big. This goes down. It's still there, it's not as big. If you now move down to a reliability of 0.65, equivalent to measurement error of 0.35. Look what happens to this, it disappears. And this is still there, but it's smaller. In other words, depending on what the measurement error happens to be or what the reliability happens to be, your conclusions change. So if the true reliability, which I have to emphasize we don't know, is actually as small as this, many people suggest it was, um, the low SES group are making just as much progress as the middle group. It's only the top group that appears to do better. Now, that's important, but it's not nearly as startling as that first graph, and it wouldn't make a parliamentary debate in the UK. So, and it doesn't matter how big the data were. You could have had millions. You had something like 13,000 in the final analysis. You could have millions. If you ignore measurement error, that's still going to happen. Um, the measurement error is still there. So here's somewhere 
where, and it might be worse with big data because your measurements might be so good and your liabilities may be lower. Oh. Okay. Well, I hope I'm not using too strong language. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so that's uh, that's my cautionary tale. Um, which maybe it's gone on for too long. Um, and it's also an advertisement for some of the work we're doing, which uh, is trying to sort of gather these reliabilities and put them on a more secure base and and tell the world that they should really sit up and pay attention uh, to them. Um, I say that there's a, there's a, there was quite a row about this because um, the guy who I know very well, who published the original paper, uh, didn't like this reanalysis. Um, and uh, we haven't been talking to each other since, um, which is a bit sad. Uh, but that's, that's one of the, uh, the things you have to put up with. Okay, so just a few reflections on measurement error. Um, it really is important, and it's important for educational policy. Um, and one should also do what I call sensitivity analysis. If you're not sure what values you should be using, try different values, see what difference it makes. That's the analysis I showed you. Um, we're making observant for some of the software uh, that's becoming available, it's some work we'll be doing in Bristol. Um, lots of effort should be going into, into this. <coughs> and I think there's some ethical issues here. Uh, and this, I, this is, I guess, what the row was about. Um, the, the effects of measurement have been known for quite a long time. There's quite a literature about them. And some very basic software has been available for some time as well. Um, it's not emphasised, uh, and it's often not available in major software packages, you won't find it. Um, and it's not taught, it's an important issue um, in educational uh, research courses. Um, and I think I made a point in some of the work we published in 2015 that I thought it was unethical uh, not to do it. Um, uh, because just like it would be unethical to kind of put leeches on people, um, to kind of draw blood when they're really sick nowadays. That would be unethical, but it wasn't a couple of centuries ago. Um, if you know there are better ways of doing things, or if they're available, it may well be thought of as unethical not to use them. I think I put it fairly mildly, but I think it was that allegation that um, stopped the conversation between us. Uh, so finally, I'll just round up <coughs> about big data. Here's the things that we can do with it. Very nice things. We should look forward to that. But it has its limits. We shouldn't rush, rush into it. We should concern about quality, quality of linkage, um, and the uncertainty in that, missingness, and I'd like say particularly measurement errors, whether it's education data or not, measurement errors, I think, have become increasingly important. So thank you for listening.